7. The title of this message is The Pouting Prophet Part 2, because last week we looked at the first six verses of this chapter and we saw that he was a pouting prophet, and we're going to see that that continues here at the end of this chapter. So Jonah chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, we're going to see that we shouldn't make things about ourselves and then miss out on the blessings that God provides. Oftentimes we make things about us, what we want, we neglect the will of God, we neglect doing what God wants us to do, and then we get unhappy when we're not blessed. Now if we follow God, he does promise blessing, but that does not mean uh, some sort of prosperity gospel. Just because you follow God and do what he wants you to do does not mean you'll have a lot of material wealth in this life. What God is saying, he, he will bless you with eternal life. You will have blessings in heaven abundantly. But are we willing to do what God wants us to do? Don't make things about ourself, but, but keep it about God. When God is the center of our focus, then life will be much better because we'll be in the center of his will. Last week, we looked at verses 1 through 6, and Jonah did not take joy in the great work that God was doing. And honestly, he missed out. Imagine having a, a missionary go somewhere and, and preach the gospel. Many come to Jesus, and then that missionary's angry. He's angry that people responded to the message he gave. He's angry that people changed their life and turned to Jesus. That's what Jonah does. Jonah did not show any joy until chapter 4 when God provided a plant for him. That's where we finished last week. Jonah did not take joy in, in serving God. He did not take joy... And the blessing of people responding to God's message, but he did take joy in a plant that God provided to give him shade. He took joy in having shade, but he did not take joy in lost Ninevites responding to God. I hope that is not the case in any of our lives. I hope we don't take joy in just the things that we want in this world and not take joy in, in what God has for us. Jonah 4, verses 7 through 11. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over, and nor did you grow it. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right, hand, uh, their right and their left, as well as many animals? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this text. God, I thank you for the story of Jonah and how we can learn from it that we need to be uh, prophets for you running out and doing your will. God, I pray this morning you would open our hearts to be receptive to your word. God, I pray that we would leave here changed people, that we would take what we learned this morning, what your word says, and we would apply it to our lives. God, I pray that the words I speak this morning would not be my words, but they would be your words. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jay Leno, who is famous for his late night television shows and other things he does in media, did this thing called Man on the Street Interview. And he would go around his show and he would ask people questions on the street and see what their answers would be. And sometimes when you ask someone a question, they're caught off guard, you'll get some, some crazy answers. And so this time he was going to do something, uh, a Man on the Street Interview, but questions about the Bible. And he went to a young man and he, he asked this, According to the Bible, who was swallowed by a whale? And this young man felt confident in his answer, and he shouted out to him on TV, Pinocchio. And we, we do know that as children, when you watch that movie, Pinocchio was in a whale. Uh, we do not know that Jonah was in a whale, per se, but a, a great fish. But after going through this series, I hope that we can all answer that question. I hope that we all know who was swallowed by a great fish in the Bible, but I also hope that we can all answer the question of what is Jonah really about? What is this book of the Bible really about? Because it's not about a, a man and a great fish, but again, it is about a man and his great God. 
It's not about a, a great fish. It's about a great God and his love for his creation, not just Israel, not just Jonah, not just his prophets, but for all mankind, including the Ninevites who were a, a wicked nation, a, a terrifying nation. God loved them and God sent his son to die for them as well. Starting in verse 7. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. Now that God had provided Jonah with this plant, he takes it away. I think about the story of Job. You know, when God gives things to us, it doesn't mean we get to keep them forever. Sometimes God will give us things and he will take them away from us. Everything that God gives us is a blessing. What do we do with it when we have it here we see that he has given Jonah this plan, is taken away. In the story of Job, God has blessed that man incredibly. He had so much. And when God took it all the way, what did he say? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We can find joy in God, not materialism. And here, Jonah has found joy in this plant the shady has, and now God has taken it away. And God again prepared or appointed this plant and this worm. He prepared and appointed that storm that caused the men to throw Jonah overboard. He appointed and prepared the fish to come and swallow Jonah. He appointed and prepared the plant to give him shade. And now he appoints and he uh, prepares a worm to go and destroy that plant. Jonah, who is finally happy in this story as it's uh, beginning to come to an end, has his happiness short-lived and it's taken away from him. One moment Jonah is preaching for God and the next moment he's abandoned his post. He has now left the city. He's waiting and hoping that God will bring destruction upon it. Don't let that be said of you or I this morning. That we get so wrapped up in the happiness that we have in this life that is so short-lived that we miss out on what God wants us to do. The blessings that God can give us. Jonah had called a whole city to repentance, but notice the, the person in the story that has trouble repenting. It's the prophet who has brought so many to repentance. Notice that the, the storm obeyed God. The fish obeyed God. The, the vine or the plant obeyed God. The worm obeyed God. But Jonah did not obey God. He, he did what God wanted him to do, but he did it with a, with a closed-off heart. He wasn't in it full-heartedly. He didn't have an open heart to what God wanted him to do. And just as Jonah's happiness was short-lived, so will our joy in the things of the world. Be focused on what matters in eternity. Don't be focused on how much money you can have in the bank account, how, how much fun you can have in this life. The Scripture tells that this life is like a vapor. It just comes and goes in an instant. Our timing is not like God's timing. What we may think is a, a long period of time is insignificant to God because it's so short. This worm was able to quickly destroy this plant. God had appointed it to go and destroy this plant. And sin that enters our lives is like this worm. It can take away our joy so quickly and yet we focus on it. We can have joy of the things of the world and we can take uh, joy in different sins. We can take joy in the things we have and the things that we are blessed with, but they are so short-lived. Destruction has been a common theme in this book. Lots of talk about destruction. Even Jonah going and saying, destruction is going to come in 40 days. Nineveh will be overthrown. But notice the only thing that actually gets destroyed in this entire story is this plant. God would use this as a teaching tool for his prophet Jonah. Verse 8, As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, It's better for me to die than to live. Remember, Jonah was angry at God because the Ninevites were coming to him because God was blessing them. And we see that in chapter 4, verse 1 that we talked about last week. And the Hebrew word for angry literally means to be hot. He was, he was filled with anger. He had a raging anger inside of him. And it's a little bit ironic because now God's going to use the heat to teach Jonah a lesson. Jonah missed this plant so much, this pleasant shade that he had, and again he claims that it would be better to die than to live. 
here God again appoints or prepares an element of nature to use to teach Jonah a lesson. And this time, it's a, a great uh, wind, a heat wind. And the uh, studies on winds and, and storms in this region, uh, looking at it, one a study said this, most identify this wind as the Sirocco. When this wind is experienced in the Near East, the temperature rises dramatically, the humidity drops quickly. It's a constant, extremely hot wind that contains fine particles of dust. It contains constant hot air so full of positive ions that it affects the levels of serotonin and other brain neurotransmitters, causing exhaustion, depression, feeling of unreality, and occasionally bizarre behavior. Maybe this is the type of storm God used because we see some bizarre behavior in this prophet. He'd rather die than to live without this shade. The verb here used for uh, growing faint, that he uh, felt like he was about to faint, is almost identical to the same word that was used in chapter 2, verse 7, when he felt like his life was ebbing away. He thought he was on death's door. And in this moment, maybe, just maybe, Jonah actually thought, God is going to answer my prayer and take my life away from me. See, God is always with us. And I hope that nobody here ever gets to the point of feeling like it is better to die than to live. That is not what God wants us to feel at his people. He does not want us to feel like we are hopeless or helpless because we have hope and we have help in Jesus. And Jonah here is experiencing the opposite. He would rather die than to live. Verse 9, Then God asked Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, yes, it is right, he replied. I am angry enough to die. God again asked Jonah whether it is right for him to be angry. Jonah answers God this time, but he answers incorrectly. God has already asked him previously, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah didn't give a response. Here, he does give a response, but it's not a good one. He responds to God in anger. Yes, it's right. Yes, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. Jonah still has a heart issue. He's had a heart issue this entire book. Chapter 1, he knew God's will and he ran away from it. That's a heart issue. Chapter 2, he cries out to God for help and God does rescue him, but he still had a heart issue. Chapter 3, he does what God wanted him to do, but his heart was not in it. It's a heart issue. Now he continues in his anger against God. This prophet of God is struggling to submit to God. He had a heart issue. Was it right for Jonah to be angry? Was it right for him to be angry about this plant? Simply put, absolutely not. He should have been more concerned about the lost souls of Nineveh than he was about a plant. Plant grow, uh, plants grow and die but humans, they, they die and then they face eternity, either separated from God forever or living in heaven with him. But notice Jonah is more concerned about this plant. He is happy about the plant being there and then uh, very sad the plant is gone. But he didn't take joy in the fact that people were coming to God. Was it right for Jonah to be angry about the plant? No, it wasn't. One commentator wrote this. Jeremiah and Jesus looked on the city of Jerusalem and wept over it. And Paul beheld the city of Athens and was greatly distressed. But Jonah looked on the city of Nineveh and he seethed with anger. He needed to learn the lesson of God's pity and have a heart of compassion for lost souls. Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and he wept over it. Paul looked at Athens and he was greatly distressed by it. Jonah looks out over Nineveh and he is angry that the people are actually turning to God. In all of this, Jonah responds to God and feels like he is justified in his anger. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they need your help? And you, you tell them what they need, you give them what they need, you explain how to fix whatever problem it is that they have, 
and it doesn't work, and you, then you write it out for them, they still don't get it. Maybe it's a young person helping an older person with a piece of technology, and the young person is just trying and trying and trying, but it's not clicking. Maybe it's the, the father helping a child with something, and they just don't get it, no matter how easily or how many times you explain it, no matter how simplified you make it, it just doesn't connect. Here, that's what's happening with Jonah. God is, is pointing out that uh, Jonah is not doing what God wants him to do with an open heart. Jonah has uh, been angry with God, and he's not justified in his anger, and God is now finally going to uh, have this little conversation with Jonah. Jonah demonstrated three things here that angry people uh, do. First off, angry people quit. Jonah here quits. I would say he, he kind of quit his profession of being a prophet when he first ran from the presence of God. He kind of comes back and does what God wants him to do, but here he's quit his ministry. He's gone out to sit on the outside of the city and look back on it. He didn't stay there and minister to the people. Angry people do that. They will, they will quit. They get so angry, they'll just stop what they're doing. Secondly, separate. Angry people separate. He here separates himself from the ministry. He, he goes out and looks over the city. He has isolated himself. Now the only companion he has is God, and he's angry with God. And thirdly, he pouts. Angry people pout. If you have a child and you take away their favorite toy, they get angry and they pout. Jonah here is pouting. That's what angry people do. So Jonah demonstrated that he was angry. He quit. He separated himself, isolated himself. He pouts. He thinks that he is justified in his anger, but that doesn't lead to a good resolution. Jonah's last words in this book that he speaks are this. Yes, it is right. I am angry enough to die. Imagine having someone write a book about you or you write your own book about your life and this is how you finish out your portion of the book. What a sad thing for a prophet of God to say that. I would rather die. I'm so angry. I'd rather die. I'd, I'd rather die than do what God wants me to do. I'd rather die than sit here in this heat. But thankfully, Jonah does not have the last word in this book of Jonah. God does. And we're going to see in just a moment what God says to him. If Jonah had not answered this question so quickly, that he responded so quickly with, with anger, maybe, just maybe, if he had paused, he would have realized that he was wrong, realized that he had a, a heart issue, realized that he needed change. But that's not what happened here with Jonah. Jonah did not want to live under the governance of free grace, which is grace for all people, nor did he want to live under governance without grace. He wanted grace just for himself, just for his people. He did not want God's grace to be extended to his enemy. He didn't want God's grace to be for other people. He wanted the blessing for himself and for Israel. And in verse 10, So the Lord said, You cared about the plant, but you do not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and it perished in a night. It seems as though this question is not as tender as the other questions that God has asked Jonah. It seems like here God's really making a point. In this verse, he says, you. He, he calls out Jonah. You cared about the plan. And then we see in verse 11, which we'll get to in a minute, he says, but may I not care? He, he now is making emphasis on Jonah. And God rebukes Jonah for the fact that he, he pitied the plant's death. He, he pitied not having the shade, but he did not pity the fact that a nation full of so many people, hundreds of thousands of people that God was going to bring judgment on, he did not pity them. He cared about a plant, but not the people. Jonah cared about a plant that he had nothing to do with in the sense of creation. He did not plant this plant. He did not water this plant. He did not grow this plant. He did not till the soil for this plant. He did nothing for this plant except enjoy the shade that it brought for him, which God gave him. Remember that this plant was a gift from God, and God was going to use it as an element to teach Jonah a lesson. God's basically telling Jonah, who do you think you are questioning me? Who do you think you are questioning me? The one who gave you a task to do and you didn't do it. 
Who are you to question me that you were thrown overboard on a boat and you were going to die and I appointed a great fish to come swallow you and preserve you for those three days and three nights? Who are you to question me that I gave you another chance, sent you to Nineveh, had a great uh, response to his word? Who are you now to be angry at me that I gave you a blessing and you, you enjoyed that blessing and now it's been taken away? Who are you to question me this morning? Do we question God when we don't get our way? Do we question God when things don't go exactly as we think they should or how we wish they would? There's so much emphasis on this plant here that could, could grow and die in one day while missing out on the importance of what God was doing. This plant that would come and live for one day and wither. But all these lives that were lost, that were turning to God, he showed no pity on them. Verse 11. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. We see here an example of the depth of God's love for his people. Not just his love for the prophet, not just his love for those that were following him, not just his love for the Israelites, his love for all people. Jesus came to die for all people. Here it makes reference to 120,000 who cannot distinguish between their right and their left. These are people that are unable to make moral judgments. There are some different beliefs as to what this number could mean. Some think it's uh, adolescent children. Some think it's those who are unable to make discernments because of the different gods that they are uh, following. It could be a number of different things, but the number does not matter here. Jesus died for the Ninevites. Jesus died for Jonah's enemy just as much as he died for Jonah. Whether it was one or ten or a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand or a million, it doesn't matter. God sent Jesus to die for every single one of them that would put their faith in him. Remember when Jonah cried out, salvation is of the Lord? Remember that when we spoke about it last week? Before he was given another chance, he, he says salvation is of the Lord. Well, that salvation was not just for him. It wasn't just for Israel, it was for all people that would accept it, including his enemy. But Jonah could not wrap his heart around that idea. And Jonah did not respond well to God's questions from verses 4 and 9. And now God asked this final one that clearly communicates that Jonah is not right and has no justification in his anger. G.V. Smith said this, God will and does act in justice against sin. But his great love for every person in the world causes him to wait patiently, to give graciously, to forgive mercifully, and to accept compassionately even the most unworthy people in the world, to experience the grace of God and not be willing to tell others of his compassion is a tragedy that all must avoid. Messengers of God can neither limit the grace of God nor control his distribution, but they can prevent God's grace from having an effect in their own life. I want to repeat just that last part. Messengers, which is what we are all called to be by the Great Commission. We are all called to go and make disciples, share the gospel story, bring people to Christ, not by our power, but by the power of God alone, and disciple those people, messengers, us, of God can neither limit God's grace, we have no control of God's grace, nor its distribution. God will use you for a purpose. God used Jonah even with his heart issue. But we can prevent God's grace from having an effect in our own life. It's about our perspective. Are we willing to follow God, go through hardships, but know that we have blessings in heaven? Or do we make our life about us? This book ends with this question. And it's a good thing it does because it should cause us to pause and to think. There's a clear contrast in God's ways and Jonah's ways. How about, about, how about us this morning? Is there a clear contrast in what we are doing with our life versus what God wants us to do with our life? Are we doing what God wants us to do? 
Yes, you can be sitting here and, and think, yes, I've been successful. I've, I've had a great life. I have all that I need. I've been blessed abundantly. That doesn't mean you're following God's will. Jonah did great things for God, but he wasn't doing it with an open heart. This morning, do we have open hearts to do what God wants us to do? Are we willing to follow God no matter what the cost is? Are our ways in tune with God's ways? There was a recent, uh, recently licensed pilot that was flying his private plane, and he went out by himself this one day after he'd just gotten his license, and it was a cloudy day. And he was not very experienced in instrumental landing when the uh, tower would tell you how to land because you couldn't see. So when the control tower was to bring him in, he began to panic. He, he got frantic. He began to lose control, not know what he should do. Then a stern voice came over the radio and he said this, you just obey the instructions and we'll take care of the obstructions. In other words, you just listen and do what we tell you to do and we'll make sure you don't hit anything. We'll make sure you have a safe landing. Just obey the instructions and we'll take care of the obstructions. And that's the same thing for us this morning with God. If we rely on God and obey his instruction, God will take care of the obstructions. Does that mean that we'll have a, an easy pathway to go? No. Sometimes we have to go through the valleys and the mountains. We have to go through trials and tribulations. But God is there. Obey his instruction. He will pave a way for you. God is with his people. The scripture is clear that God will not forsake his people. God loves his people. Are we willing to go and serve God? We have a missionary coming uh, next week to speak, someone that didn't just stay and do something that would be comfortable here in the States, went to Guam for 42 years. Sacrifice of, of leaving family and going and serving God. But the blessings are not here on earth necessarily. The blessings are from what you do for God and the blessings are your eternal reward. Are we willing to obey the instructions that God has for us? Are we willing to go do what he wants us to do. One commentary sums up the story of Jonah like this. He said, this is, a key, this is the key lesson of the book. God's love and pity for lost souls. Jonah felt sorry for himself and even felt sorry for the plant that sheltered him and then died. But he had no heartfelt love or pity for the multitudes in the city of Nineveh. It is possible to serve the Lord and yet not love the people. How unlike Jesus Christ he is in this chapter. For Jesus looked upon a city of lost souls and wept. God could control the wind and the waves in chapter 1, the fish in chapter 2, the, the gourd or the plant and the worm and the wind in chapter 4. But he could not control Jonah without the prophet surrender. Everything in nature obeys the word of God except human beings. And human beings have the greatest reason to obey. God did not send Jesus to die for the rest of creation. He sent Jesus to die for those that were made in his image. He sent Jesus to die for humans, uh, those that he loved, those he gave a soul to. And Jonah cared more about the plant, the earthly pleasure he found in that plant of having the shade than he did about all the lost souls in Nineveh. I encourage you this morning to ask God what he wants you to do for him. Ask God to make clear the way. Pave the way for you to go and follow his instruction. Notice that God is a gracious God. He did not give up on Jonah after all that Jonah did, he did not give up on him. Instead of saying, okay, Jonah, you've messed up. I'm going to use someone else. God gave him another chance. God did the same thing for us this morning. When mankind sinned and broke that perfect communion with God, and now we all inherit a sin nature, God gave a second chance. The second chance was Jesus Christ coming and living a perfect life, dying on the cross, being buried and, and rising again three days later, conquering sin and death so that we can have a life in him. We see God's grace evidenced and laced throughout this entire book. God continually provided for Jonah and even gave him the blessing of shade after all he had done. 
God extended grace and mercy to Nineveh. And my friends, God extends that same grace and mercy to each of us this morning. Do we know him this morning? Do we trust him this morning? In just a moment, we're going to sing a song to close out the service. And during this song, if you uh, have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not uh, given your life over to him, if you have not surrendered to him, if you realize that you don't love people like God loves people, I encourage you, give your life over to God this morning. Believe in him, trust in him, trust that you are a sinner and the only thing that can cleanse you is being washed in the blood of his son Jesus. It only takes faith in Jesus to have salvation, to understand that you're a sinner and that you can be made whole again in and through only Jesus. Maybe you do have a relationship with Jesus, but you've gone off. You've, you've strayed away. Maybe you need to come back to Jesus this morning. God is able to use you. Look what he did with Jonah. Are you willing to be used by God? Come back to him this morning. The invitation is not just for those that need salvation or need to rededicate their life, but we know that everyone has struggles. Everyone has different things that go on in their life. If you have a burden this morning, you can come and share that. You can kneel here at the altar, but do that. Please stand with me as we pray. God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love for us. God, I pray if there's someone here this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation, that you would speak to them, open their heart, they would respond to you. God, I pray that you would be with those that have maybe accepted you as Savior but have trouble following you, have trouble with surrender. God, I pray this morning they would come back to you. God, I pray if there's someone here who has a need on their heart, they would come and, and just give it over to you. God, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.